Uh, good morning. So, Representative Dave Pinto, and we're going to actually start with a slight agenda change, which is we were, it was occurring to us that having these separate welcomes and perspectives from the Legislative Caucuses doesn't make a lot of sense. So, you'll see that we're going to combine, combine mine um, uh, right now. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for being here, both in person and also uh, via the web. There is a, 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 a webcast uh, that's happening right now, so hello, everyone. Uh, and if you can uh, please make sure to share the link. It's available at p3minnesota.org. Uh, so that uh, everybody around the state and around the world, if they're interested, uh, can participate in the conversation today. Um, I, uh, I want to note that uh, these, these forums started in June of 2016, was the first one, um, founded by uh, a group called Elders for Infants uh, and me. And so we've been doing this now for uh, coming up on, I guess it's been more than two and a half years, which is pretty amazing to think about. And it's grown quite a bit in that, in that time. Uh, for those, by the way, looking for seats, as was said, there's plenty of room in this area and, and sit down at tables uh, where folks, uh, folks are. There's plenty of seating. Um, uh, I want to make sure to acknowledge, so I don't forget, um, we have a few elected officials joining us here. I, I saw um, St. Paul School Board member Mary Vanderwerd, who's been such a leader in this area. Mary, can you stand and just be recognized, wherever you are? Uh, and a uh, newly elected representative and the vice chair of the Early Childhood Committee you're going to hear about uh, very soon is Representative uh, Carly Cotiza Watoon, if you could stand. <laughs> and I, I know there are several others who registered. There are there other elected officials that I'm missing here. Uh, not right now, but we can, uh, we can note that. Um, we're talking a lot about parents and children today. There is one other special person I need to acknowledge. So my own mother is here today, uh, Eileen Pinto. So if mom, if you wouldn't mind standing and being acknowledged as well. So, uh, so these prenatal three policy forums um, were created with three goals in mind. Um, some other times you'll notice we'll have a discussion about this on the back of the agenda. We didn't do that today. Um, the first is to share plans, just to have advocates just be aware of what everybody else is doing. I had found that that was, in fact, a challenge along the way. Number two is to establish a common base of knowledge. Um, one of the tests the Elders for Infants uh, and, and we have used is to just ask, what would, it be, what would it be irresponsible for someone advocating in this area to not know? Um, and the third thing is to build relationships, and we've often said that the most important part of the forums is actually the break, um, because that's a chance for everybody to, to connect and get to know one another. Um, this is kind of an unusual today, uh, day today because the focus is pretty much entirely, well, I guess on one and three, but especially at number one. So we have a jam-packed uh, agenda, as you'll see, uh, with just a few minutes uh, per presentation to simply make all of us be aware for the 2019 session of what kind of ideas and proposals are out there. It's not every single proposal when it comes to prenatal to three, but it's a lot. So I'd ask you to, you know, uh, buckle your seatbelt, um, sit back, and figure that, uh, that uh, this is sort of the beginning of a conversation and it's more that you may hear something that you then want to follow up with somebody who's presenting about. Um, we may not have a lot of chance to have a lot of discussion during the presentations today, but we'll see how that goes. We may get ahead of schedule. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it on the welcome piece that I could think of so far. So I'm going to pivot to the perspective of the legislative caucuses. Um, the Minnesota House DFL caucus, which is now in the majority in the, in the Minnesota House, um, has a focus uh, on early childhood, and that's exemplified by a newly formed committee um, that I am chairing, and Representative Cotiza Watoon is vice chairing, which is the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Division. There have been past committees uh, that focused on early childhood, but this is the very first time, as far as I'm the aware, of a committee that reports to both the Health and Human Services area and the education area. So often we think about early childhood, we go right to the education piece, um, and that's great, um, but, uh, but then there's a whole parallel discussion going on about child care and, uh, and about prenatal care and home visiting and other issues that come up in the health and, human health and human services space. So we now have this connection between the two, which I'm really excited about. Um, the first committee meeting is tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Uh, in Capitol Room 120. Um, yeah, I'm not a morning person, so I'm not looking forward, but I didn't pick the schedule. Um, uh, you can go to the House website and subscribe to information about our meetings. Uh, I believe you'll be able to see the meetings via webcast, and certainly we'd love to have you join us in person. Um, but you can see that this is a top priority for our caucus. Um, and another sign that it's a top priority is House File 1, if I can get to that. So the very first of the likely to be 4,000 plus bills in the legislative session in the House um, is House File 1, the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Act, um, which is authored by Representative Cotiza Watoon. Um, um, and so that, 
that is really a statement of our values as a caucus. And I want to emphasize that the details of this particular bill um, are important enough, but the really important thing is the value um, that it expresses um, and the sense that we have that all Minnesota children deserve a great start in life. Um, these are the basic components, um, grants for disparities for prenatal care. Um, we have um, incredible um, work and investment that's happened in home visiting, and we want to do even more of that and expand that. Um, robust support for early development and care, and you can see the details there. Uh, full funding up to 300% of poverty, sliding scale after that uh, via CCAP and scholarships. Um, we do want to make sure just right from the very start uh, if that where there are um, public pre-K programs that are happening right now, that temporary funding not be taken away, and then uh, some deed grants to, to expand supply. Uh, through Department of, uh, of Employment Economic Development. You're going to hear about aspects of these in the rest of the morning as well because there are different groups supporting different aspects of this work and, of course, supporting a lot of other things as well. As I say, what seems important to me is the statement that our caucus has made. I was thrilled to have this be House File 1, that this is a top priority. Um, I will say, too, I'm excited by what I've heard out of the Senate Republican Caucus. Um, I've heard quite a lot from Leader Gazelk and others about child care being a top priority. Um, and, and not just that, um, there are a number of members of the caucus. There's uh, Senator Karen Housley uh, has a committee, and I'm, I don't want to steal Senator <laughs> Ralph's thunder, uh, but a committee on, uh, on early care and elder care. And there's just a lot of different angles and opportunities to combine forces, combine work, I think. And the administration as well, um, Governor Walls, of course, comes out of the background of education and getting kids off to a great start. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan was executive director of the Children's Defense Fund, which has this background as well. So I'm excited all around. I think we have incredible possibilities. I would encourage uh, folks in the room who do believe that this should be the session where we, we do follow through in that commitment to kids to really push that uh, with everybody that you can. We're going to disagree somewhat on the details in some areas, um, but that overall point, I hope uh, pretty much everybody in the room agrees that this should be a top priority for the session, and there's no reason that between uh, the different folks working on this, um, that we can't do that. Um, so I'm really excited um, by, the, by that opportunity. Um, one final note, I should have said this uh, before turning things over to Senator Relf. You'll notice we have three of the four legislative caucuses. Um, uh, Representative Franson, who's the Republican lead for uh, our early childhood committee, was unable to join today and was unable to send somebody else. Um, but I know the House Republicans uh, certainly uh, are focused a lot on these issues, have a great interest in them as well. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and I should one other thing I should have noted is that the legislators may be doing a lot of running back and forth. Uh, we're due at the Capitol in various ways and coming back. So please understand that. And this will be an ongoing conversation over the next few months. Thank you so much for being here, for your work. And I'll turn things over to Senator Ralph. Thank you. Well, thank you and good morning. Uh, thank you, Dave. I, I guess uh, I'm going to we got a lot of things to cover. I have. I apologize. I do have to leave a little bit early. We have a floor session, uh, unfortunately, on Mondays, so uh, I will be leaving probably around 10:30. I just want to touch base on a couple of things. Uh, some legislation, in fact, that I will be presenting to committee this afternoon that has some direct impact on the early childhood area. And one of the pieces in that legislation is, is that we're going to try to establish an early childhood or actually a childhood universal identification uh, approach, probably some kind of a number using either the, 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 school, uh, the school system or uh, the identifier numbers used for the school or some other form. But we are, we are introducing legislation that will get that started. And what this will do, and of course, as all of you know, near and dear to my heart is the data issue and the, uh, and the data sharing. This will allow us to make sure that no child drops through the cracks. So someone who's actually up in White Earth on the reservation comes down, is, is brought down to the cities, will know they're here. And we'll be able to provide uh, supports to that family and to that child. So I think this is something that's very important. Uh, we talked about it, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, and we're finally trying to put together something that will do that. Uh, one of the other things that we're trying to do, uh, we're going to be, and I know this may come to some as a little bit, there might be a little bit of heartburn here, but we're going to be tightening up in the fraud area. Uh, the legislation that I'm introducing this afternoon has some significant, uh, takes some significant steps to try and address the fraud both in the, in the child care but also in the, some of the other areas. Uh, medical transportation for one, uh, and in, in, as I said, in the daycare and in the, in the delivery of the services. Hopefully, and my intention is that uh, while we're going to get it started, there's probably going to be it look a lot different when we're done. 
Hopefully what I want to do is create an atmosphere that's not hostile. We want to make sure that the people who are doing the good job can get that job done. And so the object here is to try and do some reforms that will make it easier for people to comply with the regulations, but will also track if there's a problem and deal with it in a, in a very uh, upfront manner. And one of the things that I am hopeful is, is that we get some better coordination between the county and the state uh, because of the dual, tra the dual tracking and the dual um, administration that we have right now where the larger centers are, are administered by the state and the smaller centers are administered by the counties. We're going to try and smooth that out. So hopefully, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It hopefully will lead to a better delivery of services uh, with the, the ultimate result being that the, the, the kids get taken care of better. So this is, this is something I'm very, very, very important about. Um, I guess at that, uh, with that, uh, there's a lot of things that we've got coming down. As I said, I have two bills that I'm uh, presenting to committee this afternoon that will deal with uh, these areas. Um, I am the vice chair of the Family and lo uh, Long-Term Care Committee, and we will be looking at the elder care issue as well as the child care issues uh, in detail. Uh, in fact, I've got some legislation already working on the, uh, on the elder area, uh, partially to do with the, what we call the granny cams and getting those so that people will have the ability to use those. We had some legislation on that that was in the omnibus bill, and so we're going to be bringing that back and... and after, upon further review, as they say, we'll be tweaking some of that. So with that, I, um, I'd like to move us forward. We have a big agenda. Thank you all for being here. This is wonderful. I mean, I looked out and I go, wow, uh, what this has grown from, from when we first started and Representative Pino in, uh, invited me into this forum uh, two years ago has really, has really grown. And um, I appreciate all of you being here and taking time from your, t from your day uh, to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good morning, and I'm really glad to be here as well. Uh, I'm Melissa Wickland. I'm in the State Senate. I represent um, most of Bloomington and about half of Richfield as well in the State Senate, and I'm part of the, the DFL party in the, in the State Senate. Um, so I, I'm excited to be here and, and to hear from advocates about uh, what your proposals are, and I wanted to talk a little bit at a higher level about um, some of our priorities. Early care and education has been a high priority for the, the DFL Senate caucus over the years, and we hope to continue, um, definitely continue to see movement in that area, and I think it's really positive that we have uh, alignment with some of the key priorities of the, the Senate Republicans, um, and I hope that that allows us to work together to, to move uh, some of these initiatives forward this year. And really looking forward to working with Senator Ralph and Senator Housley on some of the, the child care proposals and um, getting started now that we're back in session. Um, I wanted to uh, just talk about some of the high level priorities that we have um, and hoping that we address this year in bills in the Senate, um, address funding. Um, I think we need to uh, make sure that we're focused on uh, providing uh, adequately funded uh, programs to support quality, um, quality in our, our early care and education programs. Um, I think a couple examples, um, Representative Pinto pointed out uh, that some school programs have funding that um, may end at the end of this year, and, and I hope to see that that, that um, is continued. Um, I've heard from people in my district that, that the the school-based programs that their kids are attending, that they're, they're valued and, and they, um, it would be a, a large impact on our communities if, if those slots go away. Um, another area of funding, I'm hoping that we uh, have discussions about CCAP and, and how we can better fund um, that program and better uh, help providers. When I was part of uh, Senator Weber's um, child care um, access working group this summer and fall, uh, we heard a lot in different cities that we went to that, um, that providers are, are charging parents CCAP rates, but those rates really aren't sufficient to cover their costs, and they certainly aren't um, able to make the 
the level of income that they should be as, as valued providers in their communities. So I think that we have work to do there. Um, other areas that uh, I think are priorities, the system issues. Um, we need to make it easier for families to access programs, understand how to enroll. Um, I think some of that work um, has been brought forward by the, the OLA report um, last year, and, and I hope that we are able to actually uh, make changes that, that start that progress forward and making um, it easier for families to access these important programs. Um, I think we need to work on making sure we're collecting the, the data that we need to understand the impact of programs and um, to make sure we're uh, evaluating our programs and we can't evaluate if we don't have the information or the data to draw on. Um, as Senator Ralph, I'm excited to hear about um, his bill about uh, the universal identification number. I, I think, think that's great that we, uh, that's one of the key areas that we need to work on this year. Um, and then in terms of workforce and access to child care, um, we heard at every meeting that um, the, the working group um, had across the state uh, that the need for child care is just, um, it's, it's a huge issue across the state. We heard from many providers that they get calls, you know, every week they get calls for people, or from people who are looking for care for their infants and toddlers especially. Um, but we need to uh, look at the whole the whole supply of child care and um, do some more investment in our providers, um, invest in training opportunities for providers. Um, I was glad to see that both in Representative Pinto's uh, presentation and um, the House File 1 that there's investment in the deed grants, um, but I also saw that in um, Senator Housley's uh, Senate File 2. Uh, that there is an investment in this, that program, and I'm really glad to see alignment in there, and, and that's something that we should be able to, to get done this year. Um, we did hear in communities um, in northern Minnesota and other places that those grants are helping um, providers get new programs started, and it's not necessarily enough, but we, we need to do what we can to get more uh, providers attracted to, the, to this field. Uh, and let's see, I think, oh, and I, I wanted to mention that I'm very excited that Minnesota was able to secure funding through the preschool development grant program. Um, it's really um, an exciting opportunity for us to work on building our system framework and do it in a thoughtful, analytical way and um, incorporate some of the recommendations from the OLA report last year to actually be able to, to work on those items that were brought forward. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, MDE and, and DHS about, uh, and MDH, about um, the work that will be contained within that funding and what else do we need to secure legislatively? Is, are there any other proposals that they'd like to see us work on as the legislature to bring forward this year to make that? Um, as successful as possible, that we're able to use that funding as um, successfully as we can. And, um, and then just in terms of um, one other area that we heard about a lot um, through the child care working group, I, I think that looking at um, child care regulation and licensing and, and consistency in that area is something that we should continue to investigate and see if there are other areas that we can make progress in in helping helping providers um, and especially in the area of consistency across the state. We heard a lot about um, hearing that different places in the state are experiencing different things in terms of licensing and regu regulation. So I think we have more work to do in that area. So I, I look forward to hearing more today. I won't be able to stay uh, past about 10.30 as well because we have our floor session, but um, definitely we'll look forward to um, hearing about the proposals that come after um, we leave, and, and I hope the advocates will reach out to um, let us know about those if I'm not able to stay for them. So thank you again for inviting us, and, and thank you all for taking time to come here today. So thanks.
Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Cressman, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Elders for Infants and to thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see all of you. Um, I have a note that Representative Lori Pryor is here. Would you stand so we can greet you? There she is. Thank you. Is there, are there any other elected representatives here and, or senators that we've missed? Some of you look senatorial as a senator. <laughs> so anyway, good. Nice to, nice to welcome all of you and to thank St. Thomas and St. Kate's School of Social Work for all of their generous hospitality. So I'm going to, my job is to get it, keep us on time. And as we share these reports, we're going to be rather strict. So we have a, our first group of proposals is going to be on the topic of family service and support. You'll see this on the agenda. And Sandy Heideman is one of our elders. She's standing by the coat rack, um, so you can't escape. And we, but we'd like you to just quickly move over. I mean, she's gonna be kind of our wrangler. She's the lead on getting that panel together. Um, so Isaiah, the Doula Coalition, Targeted Home Visiting and Reach Out and Reach, you are up next. And what we're going to do this morning is ask you to stand at either the mic or if you feel more comfortable with the podium. Uh, when you make your presentation, say your name for the benefit of our studio audience, as they say, or our, this is our, our radio listening audience. Um, so they know who you are, what you represent, and then um, that will help facilitate our movement through the agenda. We will be rigorous about five minutes, um, and Glennis Edwell is going to be holding up the time cards. So without further ado, we'll invite our um, family services and support group, and then um, just to come on down. So are we ready? So I'm, and as you make your way down here to the front, um, we, I want to just call out then a second issue, which is that at 10.05, it says legislative proposal, family service and support. That's a typo. It should say community workforce and system capacity. I think that's about right. Anyway, so I'll have, I see Lars. I see Akmiri. Dr. Nate, I call you, and um, Laura. So have a seat, and then uh, we'll just kind of go in order. And I'm going to step over to the side here. But I'll run the uh, slides. Is that a good thing? So we'll do paid family leave first. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lars Snegson. I'm policy director for Isaiah. Happy to be here today. I was thinking back. I started working on paid family leave when my daughters were about a year and a half old and four years, three and a half years old. And now they're uh, almost seven and nine. So I've been working on this a long time. Very excited that we're about to hopefully make some progress here. Um, Isaiah is the co-chair of the Minnesotans for Paid Family and Medical Leave Coalition, along with the Children's Defense Fund of Minnesota and the Minnesota AFL-CIO. It's a group of about two dozen faith, labor, uh, community, and business organizations uh, working for this. I wanted to thank Representative Pinto and also Representative Pryor, who are co-authors on House File 5 uh, this year, which is the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, so what do we mean by paid family and medical leave? Many of you have been familiar with this or maybe heard this before, but it's good to remind ourselves. So this um, would create a new benefit that would provide up to 12 weeks of partial wage replacement for medical leave, including pregnancy, and uh, up to 12 weeks of partial wage replacement for family leave. So two different kind of buckets of leave. So your, your average birth mother would normally qualify for six weeks of medical leave if it's kind of a, a, a routine pregnancy, plus the 12 weeks of family leave. So you're talking about 18 weeks for a new mom, and then the dad could take the 12 weeks for family leave as well. So this is indicated by research showing that it increases breastfeeding rates, it's good for maternal health, good for child health, pays benefits throughout the life, plus it's just heartbreaking to think about people going back to work days after having a birth, sometimes after a C-section, even just days or weeks afterwards, and then what do you do with that infant? As we all know, that's very difficult. 
The, uh, the benefit is on a progressive wage scale, which is very important for low-income people to be able to access it. So it works a lot like um, the tiers in income tax. Uh, it's 90% of the first chunk of income and then a smaller uh, uh, percentage of the next, the next tiers of income. So the average is about 66% of income. And that's capped at the statewide uh, average weekly wage, which is around $1,000 um, a year. So this is a social insurance model. Uh, there's seven other states now that have passed this. Uh, this broad statewide pool ensures a very low cost. Uh, the cost modeling shows it's about 0.31% on the dollar. So for each workers and the employer, so that's under $2 a week. Talking roughly about $100 a year gets you this benefit. It's kind of hard to believe. And this is built on Minnesota's uh, leading UI infrastructure under DEED. So this is a very popular common sense solution. Uh, polling this past summer showed that 84% of Americans think we need this. This is across the board. 74% of Republicans, 94% of Democrats think we need this. Uh, it's kind of unheard of to find something so popular across the board these days. Uh, it provides economic security to families, improves health, as I mentioned. It's a big benefit for businesses. We're hearing from small businesses that they really want this because they cannot offer such generous paid family leave benefits on their own. They can't fund it out of their own resources. So this creates um, a level playing field for those small businesses. So um, just a couple of upcoming uh, events, and here's our contact info to learn more. Uh, House File 5 has uh, been referred to Labor Committee, so you can keep an eye on the legislature. There will be several committee uh, opportunities to come and hear more or to come and testify if you have some knowledge or some personal experience to share. We say everybody has a story uh, and, and will benefit from paid family leave. January 22nd, a week from Tuesday, will be our public launch. We have an aspects, uh, the rural aspects report uh, conducted by the University of Minnesota that will be coming out soon. And we hope you will all contact your legislators and ask them to support the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. Thank you very much. I think, um, I actually, yes, come on down. This is good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good morning. I don't have any a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk. My name is Akmiri Sakara. I work for the Cultural Wellness Center, and I'm a certified perinatal educator. Um, here in the cities, I'm also a trainer, so I train people to be doulas, childbirth educators, and lactation educators here around the city. So maternal and infant health outcomes are key indicators by which to measure the overall health and well-being of a given community. Positive maternal and infant health outcomes have been found to have significant long-term implications, not only for the pregnant person's life, but also for that of the child. And so as being a certified perinatal educator, um, what we um, have uh, in the legislative session and have for, for quite a while just about doula um, reimbursement for doula services, which makes a big difference in um, a person's life, a family's life. And so it's um, bill number uh, 256B.758. Uh, and um, um, Mr. Pinto has supported us over the years. So we have this bill coming up again. And then we also um, are asking for support just around um, a grant for culturally appropriate birth support services and doula services. And I've been a um, birth worker for close to 30 years here in this community. And it's so important to have somebody who looks like you right beside you to support you through the birth process. So from the very beginning until the, the end, it's, I can't even um, explain how important it is. I actually um, had just met somebody on Thursday who was having twins at a hospital over here in St. Paul. And she was just really feeling um, not supported. And so just talking with her on the phone, went out, met her. She had the baby without me on Saturday morning, but <laughs> it was we had conversations all through her, her labor. And um, she was having her second set of twins after having twins nine years ago. So um, 
just moved to town, just feeling unsupported. And um, just even talking on the phone with her, she, she felt that she got what she needed because her mother isn't here. And that happens uh, a lot here in the community where people just aren't, don't have family connections. And so we play that role, being able to support people. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Laura LaCroix DeLoon, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Targeted Home Visiting Coalition this morning. And I'm excited to share that we have two separate bills going forward this legislative session. The first bill is really focused on creating additional flexibility in the current language that we have around home visiting programs. So if, for those of you who have been attending the last few years, what we have been trying to do is make room for both evidence-based programs as well as evidence-informed or promising practice programs. All of these are high-quality programs, but they have different thresholds and levels of quality. So we are really uh, trying to open this up, our funding up, uh, to allow for more flexible programs um, and specifically focus on uh, culturally, ethnically, and geographically focused, um, evidence-informed, and promising practice programs. So that's our first bill. Um, our second bill is focused on increasing resources. So we have been for, uh, fortunate to see an increase in resources going toward targeted home visiting services in Minnesota. Uh, last biennium, we had an additional $12 million that was available for targeted home visiting. We had over uh, $63 million in requests uh, for that $12 million. So, um, so that is very exciting. Uh, we, have, um, we are expected to see an increase of um, up to $33 million in this current biennium. Um, and uh, we know the need is out there, we know the demand is out there, so we would like to see an increase going up to 56 million um, in the next, uh, looking forward into the next biennium. So that's our increase. We're trying to also stage this out so we don't overwhelm the workforce, we don't overwhelm the nonprofits and local public health agencies, tribal health agencies who are delivering this because they need time to build up. Um, and make sure they can deliver the services. Because uh, you'll hear from other um, experts on workforce development, we need to really balance that out. It's, uh, we have a lot of needs in workforce, um, in our, uh, both our professional and paraprofessional roles. Um, and then I will just say, um, for those of you who may or may not know, the Targeted Home Visiting Coalition has been working actively with the doula community to really help uh, community members um, get the need or get the services they need during their prenatal care as well. Oh, I think that's it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Nate Chomolo. I'm the, uh, oops, thanks. I'm a pediatrician, uh, an internist with Park Nicola and Health Partners, and the medical director of Reach Out and Read Minnesota. And so just to give a background for those in the room who might not know what Reach Out and Read is or what we do, uh, we are a early literacy guidance and promotion uh, nonprofit that was started about 30 years ago. We've been in Minnesota for about 25 years now. And what we do is we partner with pediatricians and nurse practitioners who are, are giving the wealth child checks that all our families are going to uh, when they take your child in to get them weighed and get their shots. Uh, and we have the physicians provide a book. Uh, and not only a book um, that is developmentally appropriate and when uh, we're possible bilingual, uh, it, they also provide some early literacy guidance, right? So it's different reading to a six month old versus a two year old versus a five year old. And some of that can lead to frustration for parents. And so we try to break down some of those barriers uh, by talking about different skills they can use. And really this is partnering uh, a trusted messenger, right? You, a lot of families trust what their uh, uh, pediatrician or their family provider is telling them with this message of the importance of early brain development. And then we meet families where they're at. They're already coming into the clinic for their checkups. They don't have to do extra forms. They don't have to go through any other places. So, well, what is this shown to do? Well, the impact is shown over the last 30 years. There's been over a dozen peer-reviewed research studies that have shown that we increase parent engagement. 
So parents are more likely to read out loud with their child, more likely to talk about reading as one of their favorite family activities. Improved vocabulary scores for children who are served by reach out and read clinics versus those who are not. Uh, decreased speech delay. Buffers against toxic stress. So um, many people in this room have heard about things like adverse childhood experiences uh, and the toxic stress and how that can change our outcomes. Reading out loud with your child actually helps buffer against some of those adverse childhood experiences. And then we're cost effective and scalable because we're already using the pre-existing healthcare infrastructure. Uh, one of the quotes that one of my colleagues likes to say is, you give us a little bit of money and we'll throw in the doctors for free, right? Uh, and, that, and that is part of the beauty of Reach Out and Read. <laughs> and uh, we've estimated for uh, the program $20 <coughs> per child per year. So uh, not a whole lot of programs can deliver that um, at that level. And so where we are at right now in Minnesota is we are reaching uh, about a little over 40% of children between the ages of six months and five years. We're in about 50% of counties in Minnesota. And in the Twin Cities, we're even higher, about 50% of uh, children in um, the Twin Cities area are covered by Reach Out and Read. And Reach Out and Read Minnesota is one of the more innovative leaders in the country uh, as far as how we're utilizing the program. So we have an early math literacy pilot that we're one of the few programs in the country that are participating in that. Uh, we have partnered with the Minnesota Children's Museum to do a pilot on play and how our providers can encourage play uh, during the visits. And then one of the ways we've really been able to uh, capture uh, uh, excitement from cities is a bookend community, a bookend city campaign where every clinic that f serves uh, uh, children in that city uh, is enrolled in Reach Out Read at a high level. And we're proud to announce that Minneapolis is going to be the first major city in the country that's going to be a bookend city um, as of last month. So uh, that's a big accomplishment that's been a way to bring in mayor's offices and other community stakeholders. Um, the Minnesota chapter of the AAP is uh, highly supportive of you seeing the flyers at your table. It's one of the priorities uh, that they've set out for their early childhood agenda. Uh, we are partnering with Little Moments Count, which is an organization that is the backing of ma uh, six major healthcare systems. Uh, that's showing that Reach Out and Read is one of the ways we can scale up and, and create a more broader campaign of early brain uh, and early childhood awareness. And so state support would expand the program into areas of the state that currently don't have the Reach Out and Read affiliated clinics, improve and ensure program quality by funding training uh, and high-touch technical support, integrate Reach Out and Read into systems, communities, and early childhood networks to achieve sustainability. And probably one of the more exciting ways is that, you know, when it's at its peak, we are able to kind of help educate parents and families about other ch early childhood opportunities. And so we've worked in the past with Help Me Grow and giving out a bookmark with the book to say that this is a way you can connect to this other service uh, within the community and, and reach out and read when it's performing at its best, can do that for many other uh, early childhood support systems to connect our families to. So uh, just briefly, how other states are funding Reach Out and Read, there's line item funding, uh, either through departments of education, human services, or human health, and then the competitive grant funding uh, that several states you have used, and even a tobacco tax uh, to help fund uh, Reach Out and Read in other states. And so we don't have any specific legislation at this time, but we're really interested in talking about the uh, legislation that's out there and how we could find ways to uh, carve up money to help support Reach Out and Read and make it the standard of care in Minnesota. I want to thank our panel and invite our next panel down. Um, again, this is for the community workforce and system capacity. Thank you, by the way, to our last panel. That was excellent. Yeah, have to kind of take a deep breath, you know, just stretch your arms, do something, you know, sort of absorb all this goodness that we're hearing. So, <laughs> all right. I think we look assembled, assembled enough. So. And I'm going to ask our, our speakers to do their own clicking because sometimes I don't know what the next slide is. So, so community, workforce, and system capacity. Here we are. Is voices and choices here? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm just, my, my eyes are not. So I think... Transforming the workforce. Here you are. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Krista Anders, and I help to lead the statewide conversations that we're having around the early childhood workforce. You may have heard of our work uh, referred to as the B8 Workforce Core Team, and I just want to explain that, that title. B8 refers to birth through eight, and that's from, um, we take that name from the National Academies of uh, Sciences 2015 a report called Transforming the Early Childhood Workforce for Birth Through Age 8. And that report had a series of 13 recommendations and we are working in Minnesota to develop Minnesota specific recommendations based on that plan. So we know we have a crisis in Minnesota. We, we don't have enough qualified early childhood educators to take care of all of the families who need care for their children so that they can go to work. So. As, as we're talking about lots of early childhood investments and we need to do all of those things, but if we don't have qualified adults to take care of children, then the whole system doesn't work. And so that's really what we've been focusing on. And we have prioritized a series of policy recommendations that build on things that we already know work. Oh, do I have the clicker? So I want to say um, that Representative Pinto has been encouraging us to really come together. And so the timing of this is a little off, but we are having a meeting on Wednesday, January 16th at 1 o'clock. For any of you who are working on legislative proposals related to the adults, the workforce. So if I haven't already extended an invitation to you and you're interested, please uh, reach out to me and we'll get you the details on that. So these are just um, our policy recommendations that we have for 2019. We're again gonna be working with others who have uh, bills and proposals to see how we can align our work. So I don't have any bill numbers for you today. Um, hopefully after the 16th we will. Um, so our policy proposals uh, increase funding for teach, retain, and CDA awards. Uh, you probably all know that earning a bachelor's degree in early childhood is the lowest paid bachelor's degree you can get. And so we really need to do some um, wage supplements and other things to increase funding for those who want to go into the field so we can recruit and retain the providers. So uh, TEACH uh, provides some money so that uh, existing professionals can um, get higher education and the RETAIN program uh, provides bonuses to uh, folks who are already in the field and the CDA helps people get that kind of that entry into the field so they can move their way up into associate degrees and bachelor's degrees. Um, you've heard about DEED, we wanna, we um, fully support those. We'd like to see some workforce supports in those um, when we're bringing those out into greater Minnesota. We wanna build on this two year occupational grant pilot program that paid, um, last dollar in, so there's full tuition waivers for folks pursuing their associate's degree. And this is a little bit different than TEACH in that it would, um, it applies to recent high school graduates, so it's getting people into the field. Uh, we want to expand the Grow Your Own to include early childhood, um, expand supports to increase the numbers of teachers of colors and American Indian teachers. Uh, lots of talk about doing that for K-12. It's equally important to do that in the early childhood space and then implement tax credits, both to support families, but also to support workers. Again, it's the lowest paid bachelor's degree you can get, and so if we don't do some kind of wage supplements, we're gonna have a really hard time convincing people to go into that. So again, um, you can find out more on our website, which is www.ecworkforcemn.org. I should have put it on the slide, sorry. So it's earlychildhoodworkforcemn.org. My contact information is on there as well. And so we look forward to continuing to work with all of you, align our legislative proposals, and support the really, really important adults who are taking care of our kids. Hi, I'm Gail Kelly, I'm Executive Director for the Minnesota Head Start Association. And I'm here actually in support of someone else's le legislation, so I want to be clear. The um, Minnesota Head Start Association met over the summer to address the workforce shortage that was affecting all of us, affects all of us that are in the early childhood field. And we really were looking at what are our best solutions. And I think in the, in the system of shortage, 
often you want to do the first thing that'll, uh, that'll improve something quickly, but our community really decided they wanted to do the thing that will improve it right. So one of the things we looked at is that we have 55% of the kids in our program and the families in our program are culturally diverse. And we're not doing right by our children. And we cannot um, address equity if those teachers don't reflect the backgrounds and cultures that our children come from. So we really want to build, right now in Head Start, we have about 30% of our teachers who are culturally diverse and about 38 that are bilingual. And our goal is to see that that um, percentage increases significantly in the next five years. So we have joined a coalition that's called the Coalition um, to Increase Teachers of Color and American Indian, uh, uh, American Indian Teachers in Minnesota to try to build on their platform to make sure that early childhood is a significant player in their, their system of bills that are addressing how we increase the number of teachers of color. It's a comprehensive bill for both E12 as well as higher ed and it really promotes system change. But right now, it, only minor portions of the bill are really addressing early childhood. So we need all your help to advocate for how we can enhance these bills to really see that they can be a source of uh, professional development and growth for our communities. So there are three pathways that we're excited about in, in this comprehensive set of bills. The first one is expanding Grow Your Own Pathways. In Head Start, we are naturally um, have the opportunity to meet families first and foremost, and we bring those families in, and if they're interested, they become part of our, our workforce. Right now, our workforce of 3,200, about 30% 30 of them are former Head Start parents. We wanna see that that network really has the opportunity to grow in the early childhood field, and we have great models, parents and community action here in Minneapolis has a, a very sophisticated model of grow your own. So this is grant programs that allow um, programs to really begin to develop that, offer loan forgiveness, work to pay credit-based programming right in their centers. The other piece of the legislation we're excited about is the Aspiring Minnesota Teachers Scholarship Program. These are significant scholarships, $25,000 for um, aspiring teachers who are either um, t um, pro um, teachers uh, want to go into the field and they're of color or if they are the first time college students. The third piece that we're very excited about is the teacher loan forgiveness program. We have a number of people that come to us with significant loans and we're using any federal sources now but have a state funded source of teacher loan for forgiveness to really help us to keep those folks for a period of years. So there also, we have eight tribal programs that offer early Head Start and Head Start, so the American Indian Teacher Preparation Programs are very significant as well. So we encourage everyone to take a look at the bills that are coming out, look at the coalition's work, and help us to advocate for more E12 e, um, e in these bills. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Renal Ray, and I work for People Serving People. I'm also a co-chair of the Voices and Choices for Children Coalition, along with Diane Halsey, who you'll hear from in just a little bit. So Voices and Ch Choices for Children really focuses on shaping more equitable practices and policies that will support better outcomes for children of color and American Indian children prenatal to age eight. Uh, we work with many of you in this room, including folks from the Children's Cabinet, State Ethnic Council, state agencies, early childhood funders, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and advocates and parents representing communities of color and American Indian children. Uh, so we know that um, our state experiences persistent health and developmental gaps for children of color and American Indian children. It's a crisis of both racial and geographic equity. And communities are underfunded, which restricts their ability uh, to self-determine their needs and their needs of their children. So the Voices and Children, Voices and Choices is, again, this year uh, leading 
um, work around the Community Solutions Fund, which is which calls for the state to increase support for healthy development of children of color and American and chil Indian children through a lens of well-being. Um, leads with racial and geographic equity and centers those communities closest to the challenges and provides them with resources to self-determine their needs. Um, there is, this allows those communities um, some fle access to flexible funding streams to disperse the funds of varying sizes that they can use to build on what's working. So instead of evidence-based practice, practice based in evidence. Um, we are also supporting the work of uh, investments in child care assistance program led through the Kids Can't Wait Coalition, which you'll hear from Claire and Eric in a little bit. In addition to these two priorities, we'll continue our work advancing equitable practices and policies with state agencies and through the systems reform efforts that are afoot. And we also have an equity blog series um, that has some, some great posts. So this week, or next, later this week on Thursday, um, January 17th from 10 to 11.30, we'll be having our legislative kickoff, really centered around creating beloved community. This will happen in the state capitol rotunda. And it's we th we're thinking about this as a celebration and an opportunity to celebrate beloved community, center dignity and equity in the work um, ahead around kids of color and American Indian children in our state. If you have more questions, please feel free to connect with me or Diane, um, folks from Children's Defense Fund, and in particular, May Los Loso, whose contact information is up here. Um, we hope to see you all on Thursday. Good morning. I'm Diane Halsey, uh, and today I am representing the uh, State Early Learning Council, the Governor's Early Learning Council. I'm um, standing in for Nancy Jost, who is our chair, and she was unable to be here today. Um, pretty much the Early Learning Council has set forth a list of priorities this year, and many of them are covered by much of what you have heard already and will continue to hear, and so I'm just highlighting today a couple that haven't really been covered by anyone else. Um, the, um, the first one is around our state Help Me Grow. Um, the Help Me Grow, many of you may be familiar with um, Help Me Grow as a, as a system that helps to support uh, children or families that have children with special needs and we are looking to actually grow that system uh, to be something much more comprehensive across the whole early childhood system and so a couple of the items that need further support uh, in order to grow this are person-to-person -person assistance from knowledgeable people that um, know and are culturally responsive to staff and better understand family and children's needs, can help them navigate throughout the entire system, as well as resources to um, rigorously engage hard to reach families. So these are families that may not be um, accessing services anywhere, but we are able to have the resources to assess them. Um, other supports have to do with the analysis of referrals. Uh, referrals often come in and sometimes they just get caught or they don't, they don't go anywhere. Um, and that leaves children kind of falling through the cracks or not, and families not really knowing where to go. Uh, this would uh, allow for supports to ensure that families are able to access what they need, um, access the barriers and address those barriers and gaps. Um, and, and lastly, to have um, an, a continuous engagement of providers so that early childhood providers and families and communities are continuously engaged with each other. Uh, this would also help to support that as well. Um, there is not a specific legislation uh, that is out there that supports this. In years past, we have tried to get in to the the governor's budget, and it has landed initially in the uh, governor's initial budget, but then hasn't really moved anywhere past that. Um, and so we are hoping that uh, this year we will move past that to get more additional supports. So thank you.
We, all right, so we're, we're operating actually amazingly ahead of schedule. So I'm, I'm just gonna put help me grow up here. And at this moment, because we, we are ahead of schedule, I'd like to invite our panel that just previously presented to come on back down because I think we wanna open up for questions. We've got mics that we can rove with and um, you know, it's really a chance to learn a little more. So if you've got some questions for people that have presented, uh, this would be a good time. So um, I'm just clicking through your slides, Early Learning Council, Diane. Um, but I think this, we're, we have ab are absorbing a lot and it's also so wonderful to hear all of the work that has gone on uh, to prepare for these, this session. So before we break, um, I've got the mics and um, we'll bring up an extra chair. So Krish has got a microphone and um, so we'll just, we won't, ha you won't be on camera, but just go ahead and ask. I'm curious how many parents or families who don't get home visiting, what percentage don't get it and you would recommend get home visiting? As a pediatrician, I didn't really think about a lot of home visiting programs except as a medical health issue. So I'm curious uh, what percentage of families don't get home visiting services that might really benefit them? Good morning, thank you for that question. Um, you would hope that would be a simple answer. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have limited data about who is accessing um, home visiting services because of the different delivery systems. Um, however, uh, when you look at the 2017 um, home visiting report from the Department of Health, um, it is estimated that approximately between 10 and 20 percent of families are receiving services. Um, what it doesn't include, because um, that report includes uh, services delivered through local public health departments and tribal health departments. It doesn't include um, the nonprofit delivery system or the human service delivery system. Uh, so the coalition has been working to try to answer that question uh, more specifically, but that's our estimate of who's receiving services. Hi, I just want to add to this, there's also all the home visiting that happens through MDE, through school-based programs as well. So all the data is coming from different departments as of who is receiving. But Early Childhood Family Education, ECFE, has licensed parent educators that do preventative home visits for families as well. that um, Early Head Start right now serves around 3,500 um, children, mostly in home-based and home visiting, and that is about 9% of the income eligible, so our eligibility is 100% um, of poverty, so that's about 9% of income eligible um, families. My name is Sarah Ridley, and I am a home visitor in the Birth to Three Early Intervention Program. We are seeing an astronomical amount of children that are um, exhibiting developmental delays, which we are now watching a trend of how parents who are using screens are interrupting the developmental process of a child. And I've tried, um, we're putting together a program where parents focus on me while you feed, <laughs> because we're noticing um, through our birth centers that we're connecting with, our NICUs, our skin to skin, um, education that we are wanting to get the education out to parents about their own awareness of them using screens while they're interacting with their infants and children and how that is now becoming um, an addictive cycle for their child and how that is interfering and replacing the other developmental things that a baby's brain needs to grow and so I think about what's going on with um, reach and read and we have been trying to partner with every referral that comes in through help me grow back to the physicians to get this education to every parent that has a baby and has those well child checks. I am looking to partner with how we can do more public policy and education because I do believe this is one thing that we can do for our next generation of babies. 
for their emotional, behavioral regulation, um, their language development. And we are now educating our very first group of parents that are first generation to immigrants, I mean to native technology users, handheld constant technology users. And it is absolutely impacting development of children. So anyone I can partner with, I would love to partner with Reach and Read, and how do we get this more? It's such a simple thing we can do to start educating parents um, about not only give a book, but how, what are we replacing with that? And I believe it starts with, from the very first interactions of helping parents focus on me while I feed. Yeah, that's um, a, a problem we're seeing more and more, and we forget that Screens have only been around for about 10 years, and Absolutely. so as, as far as the data around early childhood and brain development, we're still learning more, but it reminds me of a story. Um, I was teaching a student about the Reach Out and Read <laughs> intervention, and she went and uh, was speaking with a Somali mom who had uh, come here at, uh, from a refugee camp, and she was um, talking about how important it was to read uh, to her young children, and the, the mom thought, oh, well, we had books where I came from, and I was reading to them more when I was there, but I thought when I came here, I'd, my kids needed screens to get ahead and to advance, and, and so really it was more reinforcing some of the whole knowledge that her culture was bringing to it, and I think that modeling is some of the you know, powerful things we do with you know, Reach Out and Read through our providers, and I think kind of juxtaposing that to how screens impact them, it, it was a, a great place that we can start. Excellent. Well, and I just, I think about the energy even to skin to skin time, um, I've talked to three NICUs, and they are saying 90 to 95% of new parents have a, have a phone in their hands while they're doing skin to skin. And the research of the chemicals and the hormones that are changing between that transaction from parent to child and how that trajectory continues long after that baby is discharged. Um, the Wyzetta School District has partnered with me in making a flyer. Anybody that wants to make copies, it's just what we've learned and what we're learning about how to prepare our littlest learners for life. Um, and also alternatives to technology. And one of the things, and they're all research-based um, and evidence, um, but I want to get this word out. And I even think about connection. One of the strategies is connection. And my partner here, um, you know, she found two families that spoke this very... Um, uh, what do you want to say, low incidence tribal language. We found two families in our community, um, high, high technology, handheld tablet babies and families. We connected them, and now that has significantly decreased how much they're in isolation using those systems. Um, so anyway, I'm willing to partner, and I would love to just know how to get this started, to partner with pa pediatricians. Thanks. It's a good, it's a good uh, segue to our networking session. So I, I'm going to hold that thought. And thank you. Um, so Krish, another one? Another hand? Hi, my name is John Poopart. I'm a uh, Chippewa Anishinaabe to most of you American Indians. And I'm kind of uh, impressed by the uh, some of the uh, information that's been shared here today. I, um, I've worked in policy for a long time, and um, I've also worked uh, to f advance the uh, tribal issues in the policy arena. I want to thank the sponsors of this for welcoming me and a friend of mine, John Day, um, who is also an Ishinaabe, uh, we have uh, kind of taken notice that we're outnumbered here today. That's not a criticism, it's just a fair assessment of what usually happens. Most of the people who could be significant contributors to a gathering like this are working at jobs in uh, the uh, prenatal to three area who have the expertise, the experience, the knowledge, and a limited amount of wisdom to share with you. Seeing that they're not here, uh, I have to make an editorial note here that my wife is uh, executive director of a uh, Montessori American Indian uh, preschool center on the east side of St. Paul. Um, 
And so I get uh, the pillow talk of all the frustrations and the victories, et cetera. <laughs> so I'm kind of uh, always examining this issue. And um, as I look about the room, I, I'll restate is that I see few, if any, uh, American Indians. And they ought to be here because this is a significant uh, ground level policy evolution. This is where the policy information comes from and each of you have shared um, a good piece of information with us and I respect that. I welcome that because you're teaching me how things really operate which I heretofore would have probably not known. So uh, thank you to panelists and certainly to the attendees. But I want, I want you to know that we need, as American Indians, we need to be more involved in policy making because when policy turns to procedure, that's where the tire hits the road mm -hmm. and our cultural, our linguistic, our oral history is not a part of the policy. But yet, this is where evaluators are a distance away to understanding how our communities function because we come out of a oral history, which they call a traditional history. This is word of mouth handed down from generation to generation for thousands and thousands of years. This is what gives us our unique and sometimes strange behavior where, where it's hard to figure us out. And uh, so therefore we're often placed at a deficit in the program design, in the research, in the evaluations, uh, people can't figure us out. So the earlier we get in, involved in some of these things, the better off it'll be for all of us who will serve all the communities. I know it's just been recent where we've started to say people of color and American Indians. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Not because it elevates me above anybody else, <laughs> but it includes me with everybody else. I just wanted to share those uh, thoughts with you. I know it doesn't contribute a whole lot to your policy uh, development here, but I hope it stays with you as you function within uh, tribal groups and urban Indian uh, populations. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. I think we're, we're get, we want to give ourselves a little elasticity in terms of um, the break. So if you've got one, I, we'll take another question, a comment. And um, I would just point out that the P3 Minnesota website will have this forum recorded. And I, we've pushed hard today. I'll just say this to you, John, that under the... Under the lake are many ripples, and they are uh, there are more connections that I think we need to talk about and build on because um, it is it is a really important thing you raise. So, please next. Hello, John. Glad to see you here. I saw uh, Terry in the back. My name is Gertrude Bucanaga, and I'm an elder and uh, executive director. And we had an early Head Start program, and it was very successful. It was evidence-based, and if we were able to, everybody's looking at evidence-based now, but uh, they're not really looking at us, uh, the American Indian culture, as being evidence-based. And that, to me, is uh, a systemic problem. It starts at the top. Our program was funded by the federal government, and part of it, the state of Minnesota. But the funding changed. And uh, they went down to five years programming. And because we didn't have the people with their early childhood education, we had a problem. So I view it as systemic base, and I was wondering how you were going to deal with poverty. We have a lot of uh, uh, people who are in poverty. We had the the encampment at Hiawatha, homeless people. We have a lot of people who are living uh, with families. This is cultural-based programming. So I'm wondering, how is the system going to deal with our culture? Mm -hmm. They weren't able to do it before. 
and we had a really good program. And my interest has always been early childhood education. And we did, uh, I worked for the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, and we started back in those days, our culture, the children started to learn how to sing and dance and move, and became very uh, uh, pride of, they had a lot of pride, yeah. and that's what we have to work on. I don't see it here. Yeah. You know, I don't know how you're going to have us be part of the group. That's what I'd like to know. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a good question for us to end on uh, for this break. And um, I want to thank you for your question and your comment. And um, so we will uh, adjourn temporarily for about 20 minutes. All right. So we have plenty of time to keep talking when we get back and hear from our first panel in, um, at 10.35. So at this time, I'm going to call our next panel up to the front. And this is, this is going to involve Mini Minds, Kids Can't Wait, and the Minnesota Child Care Association. Um, Head Start is not going to be presenting at this, uh, this round. So I'm going, to, you've got a, I'm going to say six minutes just to give you a little generous. And to run the clicker... Um, See who's up next. Mini Minds. So you are welcome to come. All right. <laughs> Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, I, I just want to start off by, again, thanking Representative Pinto and Senator Ralph and the elders for this opportunity to present here. Such a wonderful day, such a huge group. My name is Denise Mayad. I'm the executive director of the Sheltering Arms Foundation and a member of, and until recently, the interim chair of the executive committee of the Mini Minds Coalition. As many of you know, Mini Minds is a broad coalition of over 100 statewide organizations, including foundations, nonprofits, and advocacy groups, and we're all united in prioritizing Minnesota's youngest children as the most important investment for a stronger Minnesota. Quick update, um, as of last month, Akua Ellis, who's the Senior Vice President of Community Impact for the Greater Twin Cities United Way, and Ann Mulholland, um, who's the Vice President of Community Impact for the uh, St. Paul and Minnesota Foundations, became the new co-chairs of the Mini Minds Executive Committee, and I'm really looking forward to Akua and Ann's leadership on improving access to high-quality early childhood programs. Um, in this extremely important and uh, very hopeful uh, legislative session that just started, we feel, as I think many of you in the room do, that there's a unique opportunity to greatly expand access to high-quality early childhood programs. As Many Minds was getting ready to prepare our 2019 legislative agenda, we consulted, as always, with our members to make sure our agenda was relevant and consistent with their legislative priorities. And there's lots of legislative priorities in this group um, of over 100 groups. We also took the step, extra step this year, of four listening sessions with parents and caretakers to find out how relevant our legislative agenda was to them. We heard from parents that they were financially stressed covering childcare costs, that they highly valued quality at culturally relevant programs, and that they valued being able to make choices in choosing programs for their children. Parents also expressed that current caps on early childhood scholarships and CCAP did not fully cover uh, early care and education costs, but the parents also said that they highly valued increasing access to more families um, for, from children, for children from birth to kindergarten. And it was a very generous mes message that they were saying that they valued um, seeing more families have access even over more support for themselves, which they very badly needed. I also wanted to, um, in terms of, of listening to other voices, I wanted to do a shout out to Barb Faber, who has led a tour um, of early childhood programs in the 11 um, 
Native nations around the state. A uh, number of you who are here in the room um, have been a part of those tours, and they were incredibly important in terms of learning about and visiting the amazing programs that are happening right now um, in these communities, and um, really something very important um, and life-changing for me, I know. Um, I want to say that Many Minds um, is going to lead on supporting the quality that parents shared was so important to them by making sure that Parent Aware has the necessary resources to support providers. And then also um, this year uh, supporting a culturally relevant kindergarten entry profile uh, via approved assessment tools. And I think you might be hearing more about that later on. Um, we're going to be supporting access by advocating uh, for expansion of scholarships that will meet the need, needs of low-income children from birth to five years old and pr prioritize throughout those groups children with the highest needs. And I really want to give a shout out to this group, to the elders, and to many who've been working um, on issues of our very youngest children for helping to bring this conversation to the point where we're, we're talking about starting at birth and starting where brain development um, is, is happening the most rapidly to understanding that you know, that's where we really need to be making our investments. So hopefully that'll be happening this year and really excited about Representative Pinto's um, bell around that. Uh, we're going to be supporting um, increased access, flexibility, and funding for targeted home visiting programs. You heard about that from Laura. Um, and then besides leading on the policy priority me uh, priorities mentioned before, we're going to continue to support efforts by our advocacy partners uh, focused on advocating for family and provider friendly provisions of, and federal reauthorization, which just has to happen this year, uh, to serve more uh, CCAP eligible families. And you'll be hearing about that later on um, on the panel. We're also supporting efforts by partners to expand the provider pipeline and encourage workforce growth by increasing funding for grants, tax credits, and policies. And again, you heard about that before. But I think the point is, is that many of us are working um, on these issues. 30 seconds, we can end here. Um, anyway, um, thank you for all the work that you're doing, and we're just so excited about the possibilities in this session. We're going to pass Head Start, and now to the candidates. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Mercanti from the Children's Defense Fund. Um, and I'm Claire Sanford from the Minnesota Child Care Association, and we are here on behalf of... Kids Can't Wait, and in true coalition fashion, we are doing this tag team. So I'll, I'll take the first slide, and we kind of have three main priorities for the 2019 Session. And our first one is being able to finally conform to some of the family-friendly federal conformity provisions. So I have those pointed up there. Um, first, we really need to in increase the pr pr provider reimbursement rates, and we are proposing up to the 75th percentile. I know that was kind of discussed earlier today with Senator Wickland uh, when they were traveling around the state. Our providers just aren't getting reimbursed enough. So we're, we're really advocating for a 75th percentile increase and um, keeping that up to, up to date with the most recent provider survey as done by THS. Uh, then we're really going to advocate for eliminating the portability pool. Right now if you are on CCAP in one county and then you move to an another county that has a wait list, you can be at risk of losing your CCAP. So we, we really want to avoid those large uh, cliff effects that can happen. Uh, then we have a few really great um, homeless family provisions uh, that really make a lot of sense. Uh, first, expediting their application period from 30 days to five days, and then second, uh, an early craving of some of the work and education requirements that go along with obtaining CCAF. And then last but not least, uh, easing some of our MPIP transition from being, being on MPIP for three months to only being on MPIP for one month when you're tr tr transitioning onto CCAF. Thank you, Eric. And it's worth pointing out that all of the things on the previous slide, many of which are bringing us into federal conformity, which is required, Minnesota's not there yet, they all passed last year. They all made it through the House, through the Senate, not, okay, I should say, not the 75th percentile. We did get the most recent market rate survey 
updated and ongoing. But all those other provisions, everything passed the House and the Senate last year. They were victims of omnibus prime. So because they got all the way to the governor last year, we're hoping that we can make as much progress this year. So in addition to that, Kids Can't Wait has two other priorities that we're looking at this year. Um, and Kids Can't Wait is a coalition of, of many groups and organizations where the lead coalition really focusing on CCAP almost exclusively. We, we do some tax credit stuff also, but we've really been focused on CCAP. Um, another one of our priorities is to fully fund CCAP. And these two bullets can be kind of confusing, so I, I'll try to explain. By the fully fund CCAP, we mean one-time appropriation this year to clear out whatever families are on waiting lists statewide right now. Then forecasting CCAP would be to build in to state budget projections, um, the financial needs of all families who want basic sliding fee CCAP. Right now, MFIP CCAP is forecasted, but basic sliding fee is not. So we would want to change that so that all parts of the CCAP program were forecasted so that in the future, there would not be waiting lists for eligible families because the funding would be there for anyone who needed it. Anything else, Eric? That's it, That's it. just do that and you know we're good. Thank you. All right, I'm still Claire Sanford, and I'm still from the Minnesota Child Care Association. I do that every time. It's not even funny, but I do it every time. So it, this proposal uh, from the Minnesota Child Care Association is around tax credits. And it's interesting. It might have fit better in the workforce part of the presentation, but it's hard to fit it all in because it has parent parts too. So that was not anything against you, Rep Pinto or Senator Ralph. Um, this tax credit proposal is a very specific one um, that is aimed at birth to five and aims to increase quality, address needs of the early childhood workforce in Minnesota, increase supply of quality childcare, and also affordability for families. And I put it right there so I wouldn't forget I'm going to talk about three different credits. It's a three-part package this year. All credits are refundable. So if someone does not make a high enough income to have tax liability, they will get that money in a check from the government. Now, it's not perfect because, you know, it's only a once-a-year thing at tax time, and that does not work great for low-income families specifically, but it's something. So the first part of the credit goes to parents. And there, you know, we have a state child care and development, child and dependent care tax credit, I'm sorry, um, that parents can also use. This would be in addition to that credit. So the credit to parents would increase with the parent aware level of the program they chose. That's another thing I should say. All these credits are refundable. They are also all tied to parent aware. Any level of parent aware, one star, two, four star, as long as you're participating in the parent aware system to encourage quality. The credit increases for parents with the parent aware level, and the credit amounts increase uh, with the parent aware level. So a higher level in parent aware would get the parents a higher credit, and we're hoping this would drive demand for quality and give providers incentives to join parent aware. And you can see on the low end, and these are just, you know, dollar amounts can change as we move through the legislative process. This is just throwing it out there. We're trying to get traction for the idea. We could futz with the money later. Futzing with money. Look at me. Um, but for this one, at the lowest credit, so for a one-star program, a parent with one child would get a $500 credit. Two or more children, they'd get a $1,000 credit. And then up at a four-star level, a parent could get uh, up to a $2,100 credit if they had two or more children in that program. Now the workforce stuff. This is honestly the part we're really most excited about. So there are two other parts to this bill. And by the way, I'm on the hunt for authors. So elected officials, if you like this, let me know and tell all your friends because we, we need some authors for these proposals in the new year now that we've changed it a bit. So the workforce is a huge point of this bill and these two credits speak to the workforce. Part two is for staff. So these are teachers in child care programs, directors in child care programs, or family child care owners who are running their own programs. This, it must be a parent aware rated program, as I said, but this is a credit that rewards 
uh, staff education level and as kind of a backdoor wage supplement because we know how ridiculously low, because of many issues, funding is in the early childhood world for wages and benefits for staff. So with this credit, if you achieve a child development associate or an AA or a BA, once you achieve that level of education, you can claim this credit every single year ongoing, as long as you're working in a parent aware rated program. So you can see if you had an AA, you could get an extra $1,500 every year just for getting the AA and just for remaining in the birth to five childcare world. So we're hoping to boost um, people's income. Is that enough? No, but it's something and it's a place to start. And then there's a third part to the credit, which we hope would increase quality supply and also boost our workforce. This would encourage owners of childcare programs to expand or start up and serve more low-income families and certain high-risk groups, which I'll talk about in a second. So this credit would be to the program, to the owner, uh, which could be a family child care operator or a child care center program, a credit per eligible child served. Eligible children, we wrote the bill so it would match the eligibility for early learning scholarships. So children who are income eligible for scholarships um, or using CCAP or also in those high risk groups that scholarships now serve birth to three, homeless children, children in the child protection system, et cetera, those definitions now match. So we're trying to encourage providers to serve more of those children and they would get a tax credit for doing so. Um, and that credit would be per child ranging from 500 at a one star rating to 2000 at a four star rating. Obviously a childcare center that's serving maybe 200 children would get a much higher credit um, than a family child care provider serving 10 children, but it's all related to the size of the business. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Actually, I should clarify, for family child care providers, they would get a choice, whichever one they preferred. They could claim part two or part three, but not both. So they could decide which was better. I know we have family child care providers who do not serve children um, on CCAP or who would meet some of those other groups, so maybe they would um, choose the education-related credit to benefit themselves in their work. So like I said, authors, come talk to me. And this is a proposal that's already in place in Louisiana, getting great results in a couple other states. National Governors Association actually recommended it for the Minnesota Early Childhood Workforce, so we're doing what we can. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. I think this concludes this panel. And we'll invite the next panel down. And what we're going to do is, I think as long as we kind of keep ahead on our agenda, we'll have time for questions at the uh, conclusion of the final panel and before our um, wrap up. So this is Standards and Supply for Early Development and Care. So this is the Crisis Work Group. Hello, and the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. So we'll see what the what the button leads us to here. I believe this is you. All right, Cisa, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Cisa Keller. I'm the Senior Vice President of Early Childhood Quality Development at Think Small. And I am here representing uh, what we uh, commonly refer to as the Crisis Work Group. Um, it is officially called the Early Care and Education Crisis Work Group. This was a group that was co-convened by Think Small and the Minnesota Chamber over the fall. Um, and I wanna uh, acknowledge that um, we were uh, generously supported by Close Gaps by Five with staffing through funding um, uh, that was provided through the, uh, the Committee for Economic Development. Um, and we also had technical assistance from the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, all of the information about this crisis um, uh, report can be found at thinksmall.org uh, backslash crisis. So we uh, co-convened this group of folks um, trying to look at two different issues. Uh, one was the child care shortage. The second was the achievement gap. Um, what we were recognizing is there was a lot of conversations in both of these spaces and um, that recommendations were coming up that might address one but may inadvertently actually exacerbate the other. And so we felt it was really important to actually look at recommendations in conjunction um, and come up with both administrative as well as legislative recommendations that address, again, both the child care crisis as well as the achievement gap. 
Uh, you can see here uh, the logos of the folks that were uh, have um, signed on to the uh, report. The full report actually shows everybody that participated in um, in uh, actually um, putting these recommendations together. And in addition, uh, Every Child Matters and Minnesota Without Poverty actually signed on uh, just as we've released it. So if any other organization is looking to sign on to this crisis report, by all means, let me know, and we can add your logo to the list. So I was invited here today to talk about um, uh, uh, two of our recommendations. I'm just going to focus on one right now, and then Stacy Stout from the Minnesota Chamber is going to talk about the other one in the next panel. Um, but we have a series of recommendations, and I think it's really important to um, also note that these recommendations were made um, with the idea that they all happened. Um, so you can't just kind of cherry pick one or the other. They all build on each other. Um, so while I'm not going to talk about all of them, I encourage you to look at all of them, um, but I'm just going to focus on this one to start with. And this is around trying to better coordinate child care assistance and early learning scholarships. And specifically, one of the uh, recommendations that we are saying is we would like to align quality standards. And specifically, um, what we are looking to recommend is that we align uh, child care assistance eligibility and who is being reimbursed for child care assistance with parent-aware participation. Um, this is something that is actually happens in 18 other states. It is a recommendation out of the National Academies of Science Transform uh, the early childhood financing report. Um, it is something that lots and lots of states are starting to do. And I want to note too that as we do child care assistance, um, you know, one of the metrics of our own child care assistance from the feds is that we are constantly looking at um, are we serving our most at risk kids in our highest quality care? That's actually a metric we have to report back to the feds on a regular basis. And DHS has been doing a lot of work around trying to figure out how they can. Uh, move that needle. So this idea of tying quality to child, child care assistance is not a new one. So what we're looking for is uh, basically a five-year transition. Um, we're really modeling this off of Washington State. Um, I'm, uh, three states I want to mention that have done this very well are uh, Massachusetts, Washington, and our neighbors to the east, Wisconsin. Um, but Washington has done it the best personally is what we think. Um, they took five years to, to introduce this. They brought lots of stakeholders in, including parents and providers, on trying to figure out what we needed to do, fully acknowledge that there are going to be waivers that need to happen, uh, whether that's with non-standard uh, non hours, um, places where there's inadequate supply, uh, the cultural and linguistics relevance um, uh, conversations need to be part of this, um, and that there also needs to be a lot of work around targeted outreach and supports. Parents are so essential to this as well. Um, and then uh, I want to also note that part of this is also expanding our, this is like weird having this, I feel like I'm like <laughs> on CNN. Um, we also want to expand the reimbursement rates, uh, the uh, differentials, so that one and two stars have an additional um, uh, uh, rate differential. So 5% for a one star provider, 10% um, for a two star provider that match up with our three and four star um, differentials. So I'll pause there because I know there'll be lots of questions about this one and move to the next. Good morning. I'm Scott McMahon. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, we are a coalition of about 100 cities across the state of Minnesota, ranging from big cities like Rochester to not so big cities like CPI. Uh, to give you a sense about Greater Minnesota, if you were to drive from Grand Portage up in the northeast corner of the state down to uh, Laverne, Minnesota, you could do that, or in the same amount of time, you could drive from here to Chicago and catch the first six innings of the typical Cubs game in about an equivalent amount of time. So Minnesota, although we don't always think about it, is a huge landmass, uh, a wide variety of communities, and a lot of different challenges in the greater Minnesota uh, than we necessarily see in the metro area. These deed grants are becoming critically important for our communities. And you may be wondering why the cities are getting involved in, in this issue. Uh, as we've gone around our city members over the past couple years, we have heard consistently that the two biggest issues that they face are housing and child care. It is, child care is becoming a, not only a crisis within the, within the child care industry and amongst their families, but it's becoming an economic development issue for these communities. We have employers who are deciding whether or not they're going to operate in a community based off of child care. We have workers deciding whether or not they're going to relocate to a community based off of child care. Now, if you think about driving from here to Rogers, Minnesota, it's about 35 miles. 
we have families who are driving that distance every day in the morning and every day in the afternoon because that's the closest child care, child care they can find. If you were to drive from here to Rogers, you would pass hundreds, maybe a thousand different child care providers. In greater Minnesota, a lot, in a lot of communities, there simply isn't that option. These grants over the past few years that have been in place have started to move the needle in these communities. We have seen uh, some really interesting programs happen from helping child care providers build sustainable uh, models for operation. We've seen training opportunities for employees and providers. We've seen just a lot of the support network that providers need to build and sustain uh, successful opportunities. We have also seen opportunities where providers have uh, received funding to uh, deal with the capital side of their operations. We know in greater Minnesota that we have a significantly higher number of family providers versus center providers. A lot of these providers don't want to operate in their homes anymore, and so we're looking at opportunities to move them into different facilities in our communities, but in a lot of situations, these providers don't have the capital to, uh, to make it work. Over the past two biennials, we've seen things happen with these, with these deed dollars that are showing us tremendous signs of improvement. The problem is, they, in essence, have been pilots over the time. We need to bring them up to scale because we can't wait to keep piloting things to see what happens and see what works. We know what happens, we know what works, we just need uh, the appropriate amount of money to do it. We're excited that both House File 1 and Senate File 2 both have increased investments for these deed grants uh, in greater Minnesota. We think there's some opportunities to think about them a little bit differently. Uh, we think that a better partnership between the state and the Minnesota Initiative Foundations, which are operating in the six regions across the state, uh, can help us uh, target different interventions better in these communities and to see what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I think if I were just leave one last comment with all of you is to really think about uh, what's happening in these communities. You know, one of the things I know is that some folks here working on the workforce issue, one of the challenges that we have in greater Minnesota on the workforce side and that these dollars have, have started to help is the access to education. When you live in communities like Rochester or Bemidji or St. Cloud, you have access to the education. When you live in the smaller communities that are more removed from these areas, a lot of times this, the answer that we're told is, well, you know, there are opportunities that are online. Well, that's great if you have broadband. A lot of our communities have either no broadband or poor broadband. So even if the providers are there and want access to opportunities, they aren't there. So, you know, I, I, I hope that we as, a, as an advocacy network can think that, especially in a lot of these communities, that these deed grants are there to support the child care industry and to help it grow and to move out of this crisis situation that we're in. But in greater Minnesota, and frankly in some of the communities in the metro as well, that the economic development issue is much broader than just the child care industry. It's business, it's our communities, it's the vibrancy of these communities. Thank you. That's a good comment about the ecology we're in. So now, how did we do this? We did. Now, we are going to the data system um, reform. So, no, I'm, am I, I'm not jumping ahead too far. Okay, we are, we're fine. All right, so Early Learning Council and the Early Childhood Ed Crisis Work Group are our next panelists. I think we're good. So hold your questions, but I'm, sh you know, we'll have time for uh, more clarification at the end and more chance to visit with, with our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. And now that I know that I'm supposed to use this, you'll actually get to see the slides while I'm talking this time. <laughs> I do this right. Ah, there we go. So again, I'm Diane Halsey. I'm with Think Small, and I'm representing uh, the Governor's Early Learning Council today. And so um, one of the other items that we wanted to highlight today that we are in full support of, oh, okay, that we are in full support of is the kindergarten entry profile. I think it, uh, Denise might have mentioned it a little bit earlier when Minnie Minds was talking. Um, but just a little bit of background that we support fully funding 
the expansion of the kindergarten entry profile for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that it provides a holistic view of kindergartens, kindergartners' strengths and areas of growth um, that we're able to assess, and that it's aligned uh, to the Minnesota Early Learning Standards. It also provides a culturally, linguistically, developmentally appropriate view um, of areas of strength and growth. Also, um, it will produce us data that supports individualized instruction. And this is data that we currently do not have, and so we don't really know uh, often how our children are doing at that kindergarten level. But it, this data that we would be able to have could also uh, strengthen, if we were able to use it, could strengthen the transition to kindergarten and guide those efforts as we work to close uh, achievement and opportunity gaps in schools. The, the last thing that we're in support of is the Early Childhood Longitudinal Data System, or you may have heard it referred to as ESLEDS. And this um, state funding is necessary to continue this. Um, ESLEDS is actually, um, was built entirely with federal dollars, but now it needs state funding to continue to provide vital information. Right now, um, this uh, data system collects vital information on our earliest learners. It, um, Minnesota continues to make investments. Uh, the information is needed to collectively, uh, information is needed to understand the collective impact of many programs in our state. So this data system collects information from a wide variety of early childhood programs and kind of has it in one place and also has a way for us as um, practitioners to interface with it and, and get that data and so that we can use it as well. Um, the federal dollars, as you all know, are gone and so now we need to, as a state, invest in this to keep it going. And so since most of Minnesota's children and their families participate in multiple programs and services prior to kindergarten entry, ESLEDS helps us better understand how certain combinations of programs support children with various needs. And if I know many of you uh, probably have read the um, OLA report, and this was one of the big findings of that report was that we don't have good ways of collecting data on multiple programs and continued investment in ESLEDS could help us um, move in the right direction of that. And so that's all I have for that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Stacy Stout with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And as CESA said in the last panel, uh, we uh, co-led a group and uh, we have put together a pretty extensive list of recommendations, but we do want to focus on, I just want to follow up on the one that she shared in the last panel. Uh, we want to see better coordination of the child care assistance program and early learning scholarships. And why do we want to coordinate these? Well, it's to make the programs work more smoothly for parents and for providers. Families currently apply for and manage participation in two separate programs. Providers currently follow two sets of rules for serving children and then bill two separate entities. Neither CCAP nor scholarships currently pay the actual costs of providing high quality childcare. Streamlining program administration will reduce burdens and improve accountability. More seamless coordination will allow eligible providers to receive reimbursement at levels that cover the cost of providing high quality care and will give children needed con continuity of care. So we would like to see uh, DHS develop a process for better understanding the perspective of eligible families using one, both, or neither of the programs, and also that of child care providers serving one, both, or none of the programs. We would also like to see DHS convene a small group of experts from uh, both inside and outside state government to develop a plan for implementation that explores questions that, we, uh, that were uh, highlighted in the OLA report, such as uh, universal ID, data sharing, accountability. We need to look at these questions so that we have better data to know 
who we're serving and, and who's being left out, who we're not serving, and if they're being served to the extent that, that we're capable of serving them and, and what they really should be receiving. And so with that, I'm going to wrap it up. So we have time, and that's good, because I think there are a lot of questions. So if I could invite um, people who spoke earlier on panels to come back and then uh, get ready with some of your questions. Um, we will welcome that, and we will have you stand when you answer. So it's fine if you want to hold the mic, but we will ask you to stand so the m people in the webinar can watch. Okay, um, we have Krish in the back with a mic and Daniel in the front with a hand. Hi, I'm Daniel Gumnett with People Serving People. Uh, Claire, on your point three, does that support only for-profit organizations and what about not-for-profit providers in, in terms of the credit? Thank you, Daniel. Daniel didn't just ask me this question when I walked back to my seat a few minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so here's the deal. Currently, no, and that's a problem and we're working on it. Um, the part three is the credit that would go to owners or operators of child care programs. And currently, the way this is written in tax law, it does only, it would only benefit for-profit programs that have income tax, because the tax is taken against income tax. I'm in conversation with people in Louisiana who have successfully implemented this, and it's been there for over a decade. I want to see how they address this issue. Their tax system might be different from ours. Um, and Nebraska and South Carolina have also done this as well. A lot of my career has been spent in nonprofit child care programs. I want them to be able to benefit because everyone in the system needs to be able to benefit. So working on it. Thank okay. Well, thank you for asking. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start. Anybody else? Okay. Diane, I'm wondering if you would be willing to say some more about the kindergarten entry profile. We talk a lot in the state about what is ready for kindergarten. So what is ready for kindergarten? Right now in the statutes, it's children have updated immunizations, they are screened, and they are five by September 1st. There is no common definition what ready for K is, and then, um, so when children arrive at kindergarten, different districts have different assessments looking at where children are on the early learning indicators and all the domains in development. Okay, so they, we don't really know where children are. And then the kindergarten entry profile, a lot of us think that that's when children enter kindergarten and the kindergarten entry profile happens in the fall and there are several assessments that take place so when there are different assessments where are our children at now one of the assessments that's used is ts gold and there are states that the entire state uses ts gold so we can actually see where our children are at using data and so if we don't have a means to look at through data where our children are at when they enter kindergarten and when they are in kindergarten, how do we differentiate the learning to help them move forward? And what are we looking at? Are we looking at social skills and executive function? Or are we looking at can children sit? You know, we really need to be clear on what are, we're expecting for our children as we move forward. So what? Once again, what skills do we deem in Minnesota are developmentally ready for K? And then when w children are in kindergarten, where are we looking at and what are the skills that they can accomplish? And yeah. so, Diane, yeah. I wonder if you'd share just a little bit more on the kindergarten sure. entry profile. Sure, thanks for asking that. Um, and that's an 
actually a really excellent question. All of what you said is really true. I think from the Early Learning Council perspective, um, we are not really here to say which you know, tool we should use. I think currently our state is using four or five um, tools, but, but our position is that we should pick one and determine what we as a state say that kindergarten ready is so that we can begin to measure that. Because right now, without us having really anything, we don't really have um, a, we don't really have good knowledge or information about really how our children are at that kindergarten entry level, and then to be able to track that over time. Not to mention to be able to to disaggregate that data and really see how where our achievement gap is laying at at kindergarten entry. We're not really able to do that in Minnesota. So our position is just to have something for us to come to an agreement on what that is. I you're you're absolutely correct. We've been around the bend in this conversation for many, many years, and for whatever reason, um, Minnesota has not been able to come to an agreement on what that is. So we would just continue to push forward for us to continue to work on that until we select something. And one more thing that I wanted to add about this system that we're looking at for all of our children. Right now, currently, the MARS system where children um, uh, have a number in the public school system. Um, we at public schools in early childhood are adding all kinds of data about each child. There's a course catalog that says their attendance, what program they're in, how many weeks, um, are the parents attending. So there's all this data that public schools are already collecting. How do we look at that as a holistic approach? Because I can't even tell you the different staff that I've worked at at public schools, the hour upon hour upon hour where we're collecting this data. How do we advance it forward? Yeah, thank you. I, to just add to this, one of the lessons I learned working with my colleague elders is how you could have a, I'm going to say red-shirted, you could be held back if you have a July birthday and, and you get, you're suddenly six when you start kindergarten and you could have almost a two-year window of age at, at, for a kindergarten class. So, and then you add the differences between boys and girls and the developmental trajectories are different. Um, so that we need to really be mindful that kindergarten entry means a is a huge window, and um, so I'll rest my ministerial case and <laughs> call on someone else. Um, hi, uh, my name is Barty. Um, uh, uh, I guess I have a question, and I think any of y'all could answer. So good luck picking. Um, uh, uh, you know, I've been hearing a lot of conversation about sort of um, greater efforts towards alignment, which I think is something that was surfaced out of the OLA report. I think something that many of us are interested in working on moving forward. The question I have, um, particularly because there's a lot of conversation about workforce and quality and parent aware, and I'm, and I'm curious as you all sit up here, um, how do we continue to help support our, um, our system of quality, either through DHS, through the quality coachings and different things like that, really think about sort of the geographic, racial, um, cultural, linguistic, sort of um, nuances and needs that different communities have. Because when we talk about alignment, but have a system that isn't necessarily designed for folks in a variety of different sort of uh, communities, um, it can create a disconnect. So how are you all thinking about, as you're thinking about alignment, supporting that system to be more relevant to different types of communities? So I'll take it first and then somebody else can jump in on their parts. Um, so one of the recommendations that we did not talk about in the crisis report, um, again, that was you know part of the whole package, was actually to implement regular parent-aware evaluation to actually answer some of those very important questions. Um, I think Minnesota was brilliant, and when we created our quality rating improvement system, we did it through a lens of continuous improvement. A lot of other states created it, and it's the same thing 15 years later. Ours was always built on, we need to always be improving 
moving, there's always new research, there's always new data. Um, and so we have some really good evaluation, but right now that is only privately funded and we think the state should actually fund that evaluation on a regular basis to actually answer some of those questions that then influence what we need to do within with regard to parent aware. So that's one thing. Anybody else wanna add? So I'm probably a bit of an anomaly up here in that I'm gonna say that parent aware is a challenge in greater Minnesota, um, and, but it's not a challenge that can't be conquered. The challenge is we have a tremendous shortfall of childcare providers, and in a lot of communities, parent aware becomes a, another barrier to solving the problem. The barrier is created because our providers don't have direct access to get the training, the opportunities that they need to get the certification. And so for them to do it, they need to either leave their kids for a day or uh, try and find another qualified person to watch their kids for the day, which in greater Minnesota is a bigger challenge, which then means if they're closing their daycare provider for a day, um, the parents have to figure out how to deal with the kids. So I don't know what the challenge is. Um, as the Coalition Greater Minnesota Cities guy here, I'm just here to make you aware that this is a really big challenge for us. Um, we're happy to play a role in figuring it out, but the geographic aspect of the child care issue and crisis is a significant barrier, and I hope we can spend a lot of time this session about the House and Senate discussing that to figure out how we make sure that every child care provider in every corner of the state, every family in every corner of the state, and every kid in every corner of the state has the same access as the kid in another area. Hello. Um, my name is Camille. Um, I'm with Isaiah, running an initiative called Kids Count on Us, and we work with community-based child care centers. Um, and you started to begin to answer some of um, my question um, but I'm, one thing that we always talk about is that um, with the providers that we work with is that quality and equity are inseparable. Um, and a lot of the community-based providers, a lot of them women of color who provide in low-income communities, um, don't use parent aware because it is inaccessible. Um, and so I just was wondering if you can talk more to what the vision is if you're tying child care assistance to parent aware, what is the path for these providers and for these families and for these kids? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this is, this, is, this is when the rubber meets the road, right? Like, how do we actually do this? Um, and I guess I'll talk a little bit more out of my crisis mode and actually some of the work that we do here at Think Small. Um, there is a real need to do really authentic boots on the ground, meeting providers where they're at and supporting them and, and, and walking with them side by side through their journey of quality. And that looks different for every single provider um, and in every single community. And so we need to have, make sure that we're continuing to support a really robust parent aware system. Um, back to the Mini Minds agenda of fully funding parent aware. Um, if we were to implement, implement um, tying parent aware and CCAP together, we're gonna need more state funds to really have more more coaches of color, culturally linguistic, uh, familiar with the routes from wherever to wherever, um, to be able to really meet providers where they are and, and support that journey, so. And also, from the Kids Can't Wait hat here, we need more resources in the system, and, and we understand that. We can't say, let's tie parent aware to all this stuff to a community starved of resources and say, just come up with all this quality stuff. No, we have to increase CCAP reimbursement rates. We have to get more scholarships. We have to get more public funding to providers who have been starved for resources so that quality, as determined by our state system, parent aware, is more accessible. But we can't keep asking providers to do it with nothing. Hi, I'm Jim Nikolai. On the Kids Can't Wait folks, is there a legislative vehicle for updating or restoring the uh, reimbursement rate to the 75th percentile of the current uh, rate survey and for fully funding uh, CCAP and the waiting list and for making it forecast? The, will that be carried by the department? The governor got elected on a promise of universal four-year-old education. So I'm wondering if you've heard from the governor's department, or governor or the departments, or is that gonna be carried by somebody else? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So right now that um, we are exploring all the 
options. I know we have um, great allies in House, Senate, and the governor's office, and um, there's a lot of bipartisan support around being able to uh, get, get this done in, in a timely way. And uh, we're, we're, we're having those important conversations about kind of how, who will be the chief author and kind of who will be our champions on these issues. And um, we look forward to um, having answers on those soon. I don't know if Claire has any, anything to add. Just that, yes, Kids Can't Wait is working on Oh, there's Jim. Kids Can't Wait is working on drafting its own legislative proposals, so there will be vehicles for these, but there, there are already other vehicles out there, like House File 1 and things like that, so we will definitely have our own bills as vehicles, but we will also <laughs> just go where the winds blow, and if, you know, anyone else who's supporting these issues will, will be supportive of those um, proposals as well. And in terms of the, the governor's promise of universal pre-K, who knows? We, we have yet to see where that will go. There are a lot of ways to do that. Um, there's universal pre-K de delivered only through the schools, or there's a, a view of universal access to pre-K, which could be done in a lot of different ways. So we'll see what happens. Um, I want, I'm Mary Kay Stronick, one of the elders, and I want to raise uh, some health care issues and Nate, I think you were talking from the pediatric point of view and reach out and read. Um, uh, where are we in terms of um, getting children into regular um, wellness visits? Um, and there's so much turmoil in the healthcare system right now. And also, um, does anybody have any in information about the prenatal component of health care that's really, uh, we haven't talked hardly anything about that today. So those are my two questions. <laughs> Dr. Chomolo. Um, so one of the other hats I work on is uh, a member of the Governor's Early Learning Council, and we did, we were pretty intentional about uh, making sure access to health care was one of the priorities uh, that was stressed in our recommendations to the governor and the legislature. Um, and, and then, uh, both access to care for children, but also prenatal care uh, being one of the key components of that. And so that's been primarily where a lot of the thrust is. But I will, I will say one of the things that we're excited about is the, the Little Moments Count campaign with uh, multiple healthcare organizations uh, understanding their role in early childhood and how that uh, they can be an effective communicator to parents because we're seeing them come into our clinics about the importance of uh, uh, early brain development uh, along with think small text program uh, as well and so kind of using I, I, I think uh, you know health care is unfortunately uh, underrepresented as one of the ways we can engage with families and communities and that's something that hopefully uh, we continue to build on did Laura, did Laura have a comment too thank you uh, Nate did, go ahead. good morning um, Laura LaCroix DeLune again this time I'm actually speaking on behalf of Minnesota's prenatal to three coalition we do, um, we are actively supporting some legislation. Uh, it's called the Integrated Healthcare for High-Risk Pregnancies. And uh, this is an effort that is really focused uh, on improving prenatal outcomes and birth outcomes for American-born, African-American women and Native American women in Minnesota. Uh, so the focus is really trying to um, allow them access to more culturally appropriate and culturally relevant um, prenatal care and uh, services for their children after they're born. So we are really trying to address the maternal death rate that is incredibly high in these populations, regardless of socioeconomic uh, status, um, and then trying to improve birth outcomes for their children. So that's one of the efforts. And then also the doula reimbursement rates. Um, again, that's another strategy that we're using across the state to help improve birth outcomes and maternal outcomes. Hi, so this actually, I'm glad that um, that, that was brought up because um, I'm feeling a little bit guilty that we didn't have such a long question time for the first, for the first break. And also, I'm um, wanting to have a lot of connections between the work that we all are doing. So this is a little bit of a mischievous question for you all, which is, um, can you talk, any of you, about uh, any of the proposals before the break 
that you think would be particularly helpful. We heard from Paid Family Leave, from Isaiah, Doula Coalition, a Home Visiting Coalition, we just heard from Laura, Reach Out and Read, um, the Workforce, um, hopefully you all got kind of got the agenda up there, the Head Start Workforce Proposals, et cetera, et cetera. But is there anything that before the break from being here that you think would be something to be especially helpful? As I think folks know when coming to talk to me about proposals, I'm often saying, I'm glad to hear that you like it. Can you identify somebody else who would not be connected with you and uh, who, would be, who would also say good things and say that we should be advancing your proposal. So can you do that on behalf of any other proposals besides your own? Thanks. I can, I can start. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to put on my voices hat for a minute. Um, I, and during the break, uh, Barty and I were chatting a little bit about um, how uh, supportive we were of the Head Start proposal that came forth, talking about um, working to get more teachers of color and American Indian teachers and expanding that to the early childhood. Not only, um, I think, for the work that, of course, that Voices is, 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 is for, but everything up here, anything in regards to the workforce, Anything in regards to the early childhood workforce, that's going to support, and um, that's only going to that's only going to broaden our field, uh, enrich our field, make it better. Um, so we are in support of that one. Um, and I'll just, on uh, behalf of the crisis work group, uh, we actually very intentionally um, decided not to do anything around the early childhood workforce because we knew the B8 workforce was actually putting those proposals together and we didn't want to duplicate. We wanted to actually um, just uh, support each other. Um, and we've cross-referenced all of the various proposals and they all support each other. So we don't, while we don't have anything regarding the workforce in the crisis report, um, it's because we fully support the B8's uh, recommendations. So. And, and I'll just say that Many Minds is also extremely supportive of the work that's going on around workforce. This, I mean, if we don't have um, an adequately paid and adequately trained early childhood workforce, um, so many of these other things are not going to be able to happen. And so it's so exciting to see a lot of the new ideas that are coming forward, and Many Minds is very supportive of it. But there's so many things on that list that are important. And, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can all be um, supportive of moving forward a zero to three agenda um, with many of these things on it and very our various coalitions carrying our piece, but in conversation, I mean, we're, you know, um, in conversation with each other all the time and serve on each other's executive committees and there's just a lot of overlap happening here. So it's a good thing. Yeah, and this is speaking more from a children's defense fund standpoint rather than a kids can't wait coalition standpoint. Um, First, the Community Solutions Fund is part of the Poison Choice for Children Coalition, one of their proposals. We view that as such a, an innovative way to go about trying to embed um, community solutions in some of our public policy challenges. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the importance of community and listening to communities and having communities at, at the table, and now we actually have a piece of legislation that can actually get towards lifting those voices up and actually getting in, in, into some solutions and actions. So we're really excited about the prospects we have. i uh, looking forward to that this session. And then last but certainly not least, paid family and medical leave. Um, it can touch so many different areas of our p p policy landscape. Um, the, the first few days out af 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 um, from, from birth all, all the way up to caring for our um, elderly and family. And it really has so many great benefits that go beyond that. So, so those are definitely two issues that we're um, excited about the prospects for the session. You know, I think from a greater Minnesota standpoint, um, we're optimistic about the conversation on the tax credits. Um, we know in our communities that, uh, to be blunt, there's no logical reason for somebody to decide to be a child care provider when they can make more money work less hours and have better benefits working at the local convenience store or some other employer in town. Uh, I commend every last one of them for making the decision to do this. Um, but so often the challenge is that childcare providers can't charge enough to make their business run and what they need to charge isn't gonna be affordable for the people in their communities. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we talked for a while about do we wanna look at an increase in the deed grants, we all look, do we want to look at a, at a tax credit uh, scenario? Um, I think there's room and opportunity for both of them. 
And I think anybody who's been around the Capitol uh, for a while knows that there are different conversations that happen with appropriation ideas, and there are different conversations that happen with tax policy, and I think there's an opportunity and room at the Capitol for both of those discussions to happen. My name is Ada Alden. I am a licensed parent educator. Two short stories. On a recent trip from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles, I rode next to the daughter of the pilot, and I knew she was one of five children. As the pilot came back to say hello to his daughter, I said, I'm a parent educator, and frankly, flying this jet is easier than being the father of five children. He agreed. One of my students is a surgeon, and he has excellent support at the University of Minnesota Hospital and also has trouble getting his kids to bed. Parents don't know what parents don't know. And what I know is we have excellent licensed parent educators in the state of Minnesota that are not being utilized. You give, give me the microphone and put me on the spot. Um, they're not being utilized. But it, it, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, when I look at what's up there and think about people going to school to get, um, to get a bachelor's degree or to get a license, it costs a lot of money. So um, having worked in the Minsky system for 30 years and watching tuition during those 30 years go up and up, and I kept saying to my students who are coming in to become early childhood teachers and get that degree that it's going to get better. It's going to get better. If you work in child care, you make the least, but there are always jobs. If you work in Head Start, you make a little more. Um, and there are typically jobs. And if you work in the public schools, you might get close to a decent salary. And it hasn't changed. It, it just hasn't changed. So the little bit that we put up there doesn't meet um, the needs, and, and in outstate it's even harder because of uh, people are working part-time. So they, they get debt from going to school and then they only work part-time and don't get benefits. Uh, so that's, yeah. I just wanted to quick circle back to this uh, question about access um, and, and maybe one of the more practical measures that's coming up this session is uh, how do we fund access, uh, primarily the healthcare access fund which helps provide support to some of our neediest families. And so uh, the, the Minnesota chapter of the AAP uh, has come out with one of their priorities uh, uh, regards to um, the sunset of the provider tax uh, as a way to help uh, fund uh, access to our most neediest families. And so uh, thinking of ways and promoting for, uh, you know, that protection of funding of the health care access fund, I think would be very important uh, to, to give our youngest children, our youngest families, uh, and our uh, pregnant mothers that access. Thanks. Which, Nate, I will chime in, is at odds with much of the other medical establishment. So your pediatricians are arguing. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Richard Chase from Wilder Research. Um, this is great. I mean, if any of this comes true, we've been working on these for, what, 20 years? So this, maybe this will be the year. Um, another topic, though. Um, Minnesota used to be a leader in uh, supporting family, friend, and neighbor care. I didn't hear anything about that group that is picking up the slack in the, lack, in the crisis of infant care, I'm sure. We, we, we don't really know. I'm wondering what, how family, friend, and neighbor care plays into everyone's plans and how we're going to avoid the unintended consequences of further eroding uh, that important asset. Okay, I'm going to call on, I think, Laura, um, Barty, maybe there's... We don't have a, as much of a current statistic, but for zero to two, okay. family, friend, and neighbor is one of the most prime uses of uh, child care. Thank you, Richard, for that question. Um, again, Laura LaCroix de Lune on behalf of the Minnesota Prenatal to Three Coalition. Uh, the coalition is, um, uh, is an effort 
uh, of many different advocacy organizations. So to uh, Representative Pinto's question earlier, who's supporting what? The coalition is really supporting a number of different policy initiatives that are being led by many of you in this room. And the um, FFN work has not been talked about yet, but it is part of what this coalition stands for, is trying to figure out the best way to support our family, friends, and neighborhood care, knowing in Minnesota that more than 51% of all infants and toddlers are cared for by grandmas, aunts, neighbors, cousins. Um, and so we need to really be paying attention to how do we support um, all of these providers without forcing them into a system. Um, it may be uh, that we look at la we're looking at lattice opportunities for, for those individuals who, who do provide uh, care informally that want to make it a career. But we also uh, know that many of these providers are in the field for the time it is that their, their own grandchildren or nieces and nephews are old enough to go into some other type of early childhood care that is a little bit more affordable. Part of the picture in this conversation of why we're in this child care crisis is that infant care is incredibly expensive and the wages that many families um, earn in those earliest years as parents isn't enough to pay for child care. And so we've seen over the number of years child care uh, strategies to support it, whether it's through family child care or center care. Families just cannot afford to do this. So this is an economic issue that has been solved through our family systems. Uh, so the legislative efforts that um, the Prenatal to Three Coalition is really aiming to address are strategies that would help update knowledge of our grandmas and aunts and uncles without forcing them into some type of uh, situation where they have to be licensed. Um, and we have a history of doing this work in Minnesota. Um, and so those are the strategies that we want to support uh, this legislative session. Laura? The only other thing I would add is just that um, uh, not only is it an economic issue, but I also think it's just a, like, I have a small baby issue, right? Particularly with your babies, um, you really want somebody who's going to love up on that child in a certain kind of way. And so, I, I mean, I think also not only is it an economic issue for parents, but it's actually a choice, right? Um, and I think that there are a multitude of ways in which the state has historically supported friend, family, neighbor care. A lot of that um, went away, Richard, as you well know, um, uh, through legislative acts, in fact, um, because I think it's been an easy space to put, uh, to take um, resources away. And um, I, I just want to highlight, um, in addition to sort of what Laura was saying, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Center for Prevention has really supported a lot of friend, family, neighbor work that has already taken place here locally. Um, there are some uh, reports that are being crafted in order to kind of highlight some of the strategies that have gone on, um, that the state, the ways in which the state has invested historically, um, so that we can re-examine those opportunities again. Uh, because uh, the uh, supporting friend, family, neighbor care is not a new thing. We have done it in the past and we intentionally chose to pull those supports away. So I think also bringing some greater intentionality and highlight, I know that um, the Youth Coordinating Board is also working on some efforts to really look at friend, family, neighbor care and what that, what that would look like and what that actual group of provider want, providers want, like actually asking people. So um, I think that, that those efforts are um, at play right now and, and I think um, if not this legislative session, I think that there's gonna be more to say on FFN. Hi, I'm Todd Otis, and I'm consulting with Think Small. I have uh, an encouragement to the people in this room. I was uh, asking somebody who knows the timing of the governor's budget. And I thought, mm, next couple of weeks, maybe months. He said, if you want to have your voice be heard at the switchboard of the governor's office, which is 201-3400, do it by the end of Tuesday. That was on Friday. And I got to tell you, the time is now to have your voice be heard because everything we've talked about is going to require resources. And in order to have House File 1 be able to get the resources it needs and the other initiatives, they need to hear. And I didn't realize how soon they need to hear. So I beg you, please take a few minutes just to make a call. You may have a voice message machine, but have your voice be heard. But before Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. 
I have to speak now. <laughs> um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I collaborate with school districts, with child care facilities, with families. And unfortunately today, we've heard a little bit from our pediatricians, but the mental health aspect of all of these components, whether that is with regard to any of us, has not also been brought to the table, so I want to be heard. Thank you. What was the phone number again? It's 651-201-3400. I called twice. <laughs> well, I think the time, the time to call is, is right now or soon. And um, the second is, it really is a time for investment. Um, if there's anything that would answer so many issues that have come up today, We've really been on a starvation diet in Minnesota for 15 years, and it's really been a tough, tough go. So that's where I think we all feel this need to invest, and um, it's, it's, it's exciting. So Representative Pinto, you want to ha have the closing wrap-up here. Yeah, why don't we applaud our panel if we can? Oh. There you go. Thank you. This will be sure. You can, it's up to, up to you all, wherever you want to be. Um, we're, uh, so uh, one advantage of wrapping up a little bit early is that this will give you time because you had built into your budget to stay here till noon. So now at your seats, you can call, Todd, that number again is 651-201-3400, yes? So you can call right from here. They'll be surprised to get all these early childhood calls in the, uh, in the next couple minutes. Um, Senator Ralph and uh, Senator Wickland had to go back for a Senate a floor hearing, uh, um, a, um, uh, a Senate floor session, pardon me, um, and so uh, I'm closing on behalf of, of uh, Senator Ralph in particular, um, but I want to thank everybody for being here, especially uh, Representative Cotiza Batoon, uh, my vice chair on the committee. I think Representative Pryor may still be here as well. Is there anybody else that we did miss in terms of uh, colleagues from the House or Senate or otherwise? Um, uh, I also, um, I want to make sure to give a big thank you to the uh, University of St. Thomas uh, and St. Catherine University. Uh, yes, please, please applaud. And especially uh, Professor Catherine Hill, who's in the front here, who's been our, yes, amazing, been our amazing contact and, um, and has been uh, the driver in helping things really work um, well with us here. And so we're grateful to you and to the School of Social Work. It's been a phenomenal partnership. Um, I had not really, the social workers, they get it done. Um, so love it. Yes, we'll applaud the social workers if we can. Uh, and then also, uh, the other partner in this work is uh, Elders for Infants. If you're a member of Elders for Infants, would you please stand so you can be recognized as well? Jane, Glennis. I've said this to other people, these, these people are the Avengers of early childhood. So I'm like the, the Nick Fury uh, guy, and then they're the Avengers, and they've all got amazing super skills, and they're getting it done for, for little kids. Um, uh, I should have noted this at the very beginning, um, and a, a point that was made in the panel um, made this point as well. Um, there are all these coalitions that have amazing agendas. We deliberately did not set today up in the, we always have to do it the hard way, but maybe the better way, but the harder way. Um, rather than having simple coalition agendas, because there's a lot of overlap, the thought was it'd be more useful to all of us to do it by policy and then allow uh, each of the people as they present a policy to just point out who else is supportive. Because a lot of the coalitions have overlapping agendas, but then have some differences too. And that was the purpose of, um, of doing that. Um, and then uh, one final thank you um, is to uh, the folks who've helped with us together outside of those other groups. So Jessica Griffith, um, who's right there, and Chris Subramanian, who's running around the microphone, are two constituents of mine um, who've helped um, to coordinate this. Um, this is done by volunteers and by assistance of the school social work, um, and it's pretty amazing. So can you please thank um, them for me? Um, and Chris, Chris himself is a pediatrician that works with uh, Dr. Chomolo, um, uh, Dr. Subramanian, and so we're really lucky to have, he brings his expertise in all kinds of ways. Um, and then uh, a reminder that tomorrow's the first meeting of the House Early Childhood Committee at 8 a.m. And just a general, a general sense, and this builds on what t the point that Todd made, um, so when you call the switchboard to the governor, right, you'll say what you want to say. Everybody's going to have their different piece. Um, but hopefully if you're in the room, you're here because you do believe that every child in Minnesota deserves a great start and that we all collectively need to make that happen. We're going to disagree at different points about how exactly we're going to do that. But that general point that that needs to happen, that's a message that has to go out to everybody in the policymaking world. Because, of course, there's all kinds of other places that attention can go and money can go other than getting kids off to a great start. And the difference 
differences between us about how we do that are much smaller than the differences between doing that versus spending money and attention and precious um, legislative policy attention on other topics. So please, whatever you can do to keep that attention focused on that great start MN um, to drive that, um, we'd be very grateful. I know the kids in Minnesota would too. So thank you very much. Ending early and make your call. Thanks.